Hey y'all, it's Linda. Welcome back to my channel. For today's video, let's have a chat. Maybe you've been a Madonna fan since 1990 and you've been voguing all over your living room ever since. Maybe you're a huge fan of RuPaul's Drag Race and you can accurately portray the exact cadence and pitch of her starting every single runway with the Category is Whether you're voguing everywhere or you're talking about the categories, do you really know where these things came from, where they started? In today's edition of How It Started, I'm going to be talking to you about the ballroom scene and ball culture in general, talking especially about the scenes in New York City and how it led to Madonna's Vogue, how it led to Drag Race, how it led to to so much. So in this series, I tell you a story where you may know the end, you may know bits and pieces in the middle, you may know quotes from it, but you don't exactly know how or where it started. I'm going to tell you the whole history and today is also going to be a bit of a vocabulary lesson. And while I do this, I'm going to be putting makeup on the whole time and everything I use is going to be listed in the description box down below if you're curious. If you're into that idea, if you're into learning stuff that maybe they didn't teach you in school and you want to know the origin stories of how things started, I would strongly suggest subscribing to my channel. I'm currently putting these videos out every other week and I want to thank all of you so, so much for all of the incredibly positive, sweet comments and feedback that you all left on my last video in this series where I talked about the satanic panic, how and where it started. It means so much to me every time you like, comment, and especially share these videos. So thank you so much. This week is going to be a little bit lighter, a little bit more fun, a little bit more spunky, but the next video as a warning is going to be a lot darker, okay? I actually wrote out a whole script for that other video and was like, you know what? This is this is a bit too dark for me right now, so I wanna go into something a little bit lighter. So let's get right into today's topic. I can never find my hair things, what the heck? So there's a bunch of different titles for what I'm gonna be talking about today, whether it's the ballroom scene, whether it's ballroom culture, ball culture, etc. So we might be referring to these things interchangeably. So in the late 19th century, the LGBTQIA plus community was mainly considered to be underground. People at that time, they weren't out and proud. In a lot of places, it was considered illegal to be publicly gay. So to find a sense of community and belonging, many members of the community in large cities started to organize masquerade balls that were known as drags. Now these were in defiance of the laws that were out at the time that banned and outlawed essentially people from wearing clothes that were of their opposite gender. The very first person that was known to identify themselves as a drag queen was named William Dorsey Swan. And they were doing this in the 1800s, okay? This was not like a week ago or something. This was in the 1800s. Now, Swan helped to organize a series of drag balls in Washington, D.C. in both the 1880s and 1890s. The attendees of this ball were mainly members of the African American and Latin American community, and many of them were men who were formerly enslaved. The events were considered to be very secretive and the invitations were usually given out at a public place but kind of on the down low at places like the YMCA. Now the balls were raided from time to time due to the illegal nature of being openly gay and Swan was even arrested several times, including the first documented case of arrest for female impersonation in the U.S. on April 12, 1888. Now, some of these balls were integrated between races. Um, even the first known ball at the Hamilton Club Lodge at Rockland Place Casino in New York, but the judges were always white and African-American participants were often excluded from prizes and even judged unfairly. <laughs> Just throwing brushes all over the place. Now, because of that, in the early 20th century, African-American and Latino youth started their own balls. Now, this brought about a huge change and ball culture turned to be primarily gay, lesbian, bisexual, and trans African-Americans and Latinos. This is what's considered to kind of be the modern ballroom culture, and it has lasted over five decades, but still remains primarily underground. There are so many cities across the United States, across the world that have prominent ballroom cultures, but New York City is sort of considered to be the epicenter or the Mecca. Now in the early 1980s, drag queens Crystal LaBeja and her friend Lottie started their own drag ball called the House of LaBeja. This is what kick-started the current New York City ballroom scene as a whole. They are also credited with starting the first house in the ballroom scene. 
So houses are a tradition in LGBT communities. In short, a house is where chosen families can choose to live together and they sort of form a family themselves. Much of the LGBT youth during the 80s, during the 90s, and obviously prior to and still to this current day, had been ostracized by their biological families. So these houses became the family that they knew, that they loved, that protected them. The houses provide things like literal shelter and solace and safety. They are usually run by either a mother or a father. And these are usually maybe older, more experienced members of the ballroom scene, typically drag queens, gay men, or trans women. Now the job of the mother or father is to provide guidance and support for all of their children and the children of the house refer to the other members of the house as their brothers and their sisters. This is truly a family atmosphere. Now in the early days there were several notable houses if you will, the houses that everybody knew and these included the house of La Beja, the house of Extravaganza, the house of Dupree, the house of Mizrahi and so many more. Now remember how earlier I said that there were judges at the ball? They were primarily white and that's what kind of switched the whole thing around? Well, what were the judges judging, you ask? Attendees that were participating in the balls would walk and dance and pose and yes, even Vogue. And they would do this in different competition categories throughout the evening. Now the categories are there to simultaneously epitomize and also satirize various genders and social classes. So some of the typical categories would be butch queen realness or body face or hands performance or realness with a twist, things like that. And realness is describing your ability to pass on the street, whether it's as straight or as a man, as a woman, it's to pass. Participants would walk in the balls and they'd be judged on their Vogue skills, their costumes, their appearance, and their pure attitude, okay? Now, a lot of times when you picture someone in drag or somebody walking down a runway, you might picture these elaborate costumes, okay? Big feather headdresses, sequins, feathers, rhinestones, the whole nine yards. But in most of the categories at a ball, the competitors were expected to display their realness. And like I said, this is their ability to pass as the person or persona that they're dressing as in the first place. Now, let's talk about voguing in particular. You might be wondering how voguing started. Let me start off by saying that um, it was not, I repeat, it was not started by Madonna Louise Ciccone. Voguing is a dance style that originated in the ballrooms of Harlem in the 1960s. It was inspired both by ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, but also by Vogue, the actual magazine. So the main concept is to strike a series of poses as if you are modeling for a photo shoot. Arm and leg movements are very angular and rigid, and they move from one position to the other. I cannot Vogue, okay? I have tried. I've even watched tutorials on how to Vogue. Yes, I'm that lame and I still can't do it. So forgive me if my movements are absolutely awful. Now, originally before Voguing was a thing in dance competitions, dancers were encouraged to sort of throw shade at one another and shade to give you a little bit of a definition is to throw subtle insults and they're supposed to make the judges or the audience laugh and to sort of be on their side. But over the years, some dancers would start to throw shade at other dancers just by dancing. And this eventually became voguing. Voguing is a form of shade. Overall though, besides throwing shade, voguing is a performance. So sometimes dancers in drag will beat their faces while they're voguing. They will make it look like as if they're putting on makeup. They will style their hair. They will show off their extravagant clothing with their arm motions. Again, disclaimer, I am not a world famous voguing artist, but I love it so much that I'm gonna keep trying. So just like the ballroom scene, sometimes voguing is about dance and sometimes it's about extravagance, but other times it's about realness. No matter what category the participants are dancing in though, everything is sort of embodying the spirit of extravagance. Everything is very exaggerated and very larger than life. This concealer, this is a, this is a moment. This is a, a white, ghostly moment. Now there are a few different stories to how voguing actually started the way that it is now. Many people think that it started when legendary ballroom attendee Paris Dupree took out a Vogue magazine and began to mimic the poses to the beat of the music as they were performing. Others stated that it started once black gay prison inmates at Rikers Island started dancing to catch the attention and throw shade at other men. There are considered to be three different kinds of Vogue. 
The first is the old way, which is considered to be pre-1990. This style is sort of seen as a duel between two rivals. The rules state that you must pin your rival, which means that you've trapped your opponent so that they couldn't dance anymore. This doesn't mean you're literally pinning them down though. This was more like doing voguing movements with your arms and your hands while the other person was pinned against the floor doing floor exercises, things like that. And the style was very precise and very fluid. The next style is New Way, and this is considered to be post-1990. So these movements are way more rigid and they sort of click into place. Sometimes your limbs would even look contorted and it's almost like miming in a way because dancers will commonly use imaginary shapes like I'm trapped in a box or I'm using an invisible mirror or an invisible makeup brush. This is why it is considered to be something similar to miming. But the flexibility in this style is next level. You will commonly see splits, you will see straddles, you will see people contorting themselves into all different positions in the name of competition. <laughs> then there is another style that's considered to be primarily right around 1995, and that is called Vogue Femme. Now, Vogue Femme is an extremely fluid style. This kind of borrows from ballet, tap, jazz, and modern dance. There's different styles. Some of them are soft, which sort of emphasizes the grace and the beauty of dance. And the other one is dramatic, which emphasizes the exact opposite. They are very speedy and doing lots of tricks. Now, there are five elements to Vogue Femme. The first is the duck walk, which involves squatting down and sort of kicking your legs forward as you move forward, and you do this to the beat of the music. You can use hand motions while you're doing this. Next comes catwalk, and this is supposed to sort of resemble the supermodel catwalks of the 1990s. Think of a very feminine, very dramatic walk with hips swaying side to side, legs crossing over one another. Very dramatic, very feminine, very chic. Then there's simply hands, and this is where your hands will tell the story. This might be you throwing shade, this might be you miming, but it's all about the hands. Now floor work is where dancers will sort of spin or twirl or crawl along the ground in different movements. And then finally, we have spins and dips. So this is definitely the most vibrant, the most showy component of all of voguing. This is where you think of death drops. This is where you're turning on the beat and keep going and going, and it's where you drop just as the music hits its climax. Now let's discuss kind of the cultural influence that the ballroom scene or ball culture in general has had on the world. The ballroom culture and voguing in particular has had a huge, huge impact influencing artists of all kinds, but the most notable would be Madonna's 1990 video for Vogue. Now, Madonna herself admitted that she was influenced by Vogue dancers Jose Gutierrez Extravaganza and Luis Extravaganza. They introduced her to voguing at the Sound Factory Club in New York City in the late 80s. Now, Madonna wrote that now famous song to sort of be an homage to really just letting loose on the dance floor, to being who you are unapologetically and just letting it all out. In the actual video, Jose and Luis are featured dancers and they sort of help to introduce voguing to a more mainstream audience through this video. The video premiered in March of 1990 and in 1999 it was named by MTV as the number two spot on the list of 100 of the greatest music videos of all time. In case you're wondering, number one went to Thriller. <laughs> Now, there were many people that praised Madonna and thought that her video and her song praised the dance style, but many others criticized her and said that she had exploited and appropriated the ballroom culture. Yes, the video was choreographed by Louise and Jose, and they were in the video itself, and they are a member of the House of Extravaganza, but Madonna's a white lady. The celebrities mentioned in the song, and Monroe, Dietrich, they're all white. And while Madonna did include members of the ballroom community in producing the video, some critics still believe that she nearly erased where the culture of ballroom came from, since now when people think of Vogue, the artist and the thing that they primarily think about is Madonna, a white woman. Now, other than Madonna, many other artists have been influenced by voguing and the ballroom culture in general. Janet Jackson included legendary ballroom dancer Willie Ninja in her videos for All Right and Escapade. 
Besides the Vogue video, the most notable look into the authentic ballroom scene and voguing came by way of Paris is Burning. First things first, if you have never seen Paris is Burning, I encourage you highly, immediately after watching this video, stop what you're doing and go watch it. I do know that right now it's available for purchase on Apple TV, but from time to time it definitely comes up on Netflix, Amazon Prime. Just make sure you see this. Paris is Burning is a documentary that came out in 1990, but it was filmed throughout the mid to late 80s. This documentary chronicles not just the ball culture in New York City, but the lives of the African American, Latino, gay, and transgender communities who really lived in it. There is heavy focus throughout the documentaries on the actual balls and the specific categories that the competitors would walk in, but the heart of the film really lies in the interviews that they have with the prominent members of the scene, such as Pepper LaBeja, the legendary mother of the house of LaBeja, Dorian Corey, you don't have to bend the whole world. I think it's better to just enjoy it. And Willie Ninja. You have to have the most power. Take a real family. It's the mother that's the hardest worker. The documentary really shed light on gender roles, on gay and ball subcultures, and everybody's own lives within the community. The stories really are at times heartbreaking. You find out how many of these people had biological families that just completely ostracized them. There are topics such as AIDS, homophobia, and racism discussed. There are some heavier topics, but overall, it's just a really enlightening and just emotional film. There are even parts of the documentary where it's educating the viewer on different categories and different words used in the subculture. So words like house, shade, mother, and legendary are explained in great detail. Upon its release, the documentary had exceptionally good reviews and even won several awards like the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance. Now, more than three decades after coming out, Paris is Burning definitely still stands the test of time. It's amazing. I can't stress this enough. Go watch it. What are you doing with your life if you have not yet watched Paris is Burning, okay? She's looking a little dewy, okay? Another prominent cultural influence came in 2009 when Logo TV aired the first episode of a brand new reality TV series called RuPaul's Drag Race. I don't think I can line my lips and talk at the same time. So let's just talk for a bit and then I'm going to line my lips. Drag Race is a competition where drag queens would face off in a series of challenges that were heavily influenced by ballroom culture. It was created by arguably one of the most commercially well-known drag queens in history, RuPaul Charles. At this point, we have now seen 13 seasons of Drag Race, and we've watched it win countless Emmys, countless Critics' Choice Awards, and countless praise. Now this show definitely gives credit where credit is due. So there is a reading challenge that always starts with this. In the great tradition of Paris is burning. During the challenge, the competitors are urged to read each other for filth. Was your barbecue canceled? Your grill is <laughs> But at the end of every episode, we have a runway challenge, and this is where it's most similar to the ballroom scene. And each challenge has a category that Rue will call out before the competitors strut their stuff down the runway, exactly like at a ball. Then in 2019, we saw the release of the TV show Pose. Now Pose focuses specifically on the ballroom scene in New York City in the late 80s and the 90s. The characters complete in the balls as dancers, as models, and they are all parts of different houses and these are their chosen families. Now this show definitely shows the highs and lows from the time where you've got the highs of winning the balls, you've got the lows of living during the AIDS pandemic. Pose is different in that it features transgender and cisgender actors in the main roles and the fact that the production team claimed that it was the largest transgender cast ever for a scripted series. The creators of Pose definitely gave credit to Paris is Burning for sort of leading the way. This has been nominated for and won many awards, including Outstanding Lead Actor in a Drama Series for the amazing Billy Porter. So all in all, ballroom culture has spread. It has touched so many different categories of the world, of pop culture, of everything, and we may not even realize it. I would like to end this with a quote, as I always like to do on here, and this is from the late, great Dorian Corey. In real life, you can't get a job as an executive unless you have the educational background and the opportunity. Now, the fact that you are not an executive is merely because of your social standing in life. In a ballroom, you can be whatever you want.
And that is the story of how voguing started, of the underground ballroom scene in New York City and around the world. I really had a lot of fun looking this up. God, finding those video clips was so much fun. I was literally in my room, like I would need like a four second clip and I was watching like 30 minutes of a video just screaming at my screen like, yes, this is amazing. So I hope you all enjoyed this. As I mentioned, this week's was a bit more lighthearted, a bit more fun. The next video is going to be quite a bit darker. I'm going to throw that warning out right now. It's going to be a little, <laughs> but it's something that is crazy. It is an insane, insane story. You absolutely will not want to miss the next one. So make sure you hit that subscribe button and become a part of the fam so you do not miss anything. But that's it. I hope you like this video. As always, I want you to tell me in the comments down below if you have any ideas for stories where people may know the ending, but they just don't know where it started. Maybe it's something that wound up bad, but it started as a really good thing or vice versa. Maybe it's something that started terrible and people made it into something wonderful. So give me your feedback down below. Give me your suggestions. That is how this series is going to grow. But I want to thank you all again for being so wonderful, for being so kind. You all can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Those are all Glitter Fallout. And as always and forever, you are super freaking rock stars. I love you so much with my whole heart. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye. Clack, 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 clack. <laughs>